Welcome, everybody, to uh, the Science and Society lecture here at ISD Austria today. It's really a great honor and privilege for me today uh, to introduce uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, uh, university professor at Columbia University, also director of the Earth Institute at Columbia, an economist by training, a distinguished career at Harvard and Columbia, special advisor uh, to uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and. Antonio Gutierrez and also his two predecessors. Um, I will save the time and not go through his long list of awards, books he has written. You may know the provocatively titled End of Poverty. I think the most important thing, at least for me, has always been Jeff is, is a voice of reason uh, for sustain, sustainable development of humanity on this planet. Uh, the only one we have. And this in, uh, in a world where there's a global tide of, 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 uh, of irrationality, I'm afraid to say, and this has also hit home. I mean, also, also we in Austria now have politicians who think that, uh, you know, scientific evidence will simply go away by ignoring it or calling it fake. Uh, we have discussion in Parliament today about non-smoking policies, and uh, we have plans for, for, for digital surveillance. Uh, let, me, uh, let me, the cut is uh, short, I suspect we are all sort of, especially Jeff, we are preaching here to the choir, but it's important that we also go outside of our bubble, and therefore I think ICT Austria uh, must make an effort, and we're starting this year to also make and really to start activities in science education. And I hope this will be launched actually this May with our first science education talk and day here uh, with a panel discussion in the evening and I hope I see many of you back here in May. But now let me not spend more time and simply give the time to Jeff. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you so much for having me here. It's a real privilege for Sonia and me to uh, uh, be at IST and uh, to learn about the exciting things you're doing here. And I hope I can uh, be helpful a little bit in framing uh, some of the global issues in which today's uh, scientific community is uh, such a crucial part. I want to talk about one concept this evening, and that is sustainable development. Uh, it is the agreed organizing principle for global diplomacy, and it is the framework for sustainable development goals, which will be the focus of my remarks this evening. And I want to give a, an explanation, a brief explanation of why I think it's a crucial concept and how I see the global scientific community uh, being a vital part of achieving this objective. It's a crazy time we're in, to be sure. Uh, we have capped it off with a crazy president in my country uh, and uh, a lot of danger uh, right now. And not much time to lose, actually. So we have a lot to accomplish and a very confused political scene. I'll try to explain a bit about where that confusion is coming from and how I see universities playing a special role in trying to find the way through the confusion and past the confusion to actually uh, succeed in uh, some uh, of these uh, vital objectives. So let me give a context of why we have arrived at sustainable development as what I believe to be the most vital single uh, framing principle for 
politics right now. It's not the uh, most evident framing principle, but I think it's the most important principle. And the essence of it starts with the changing world economy, something that uh, all of you know, but I think is uh, really important to uh, underscore how uh, unusual our circumstances are in the span of uh, history. And the main point is the world economy uh, underwent a phase change uh, starting two centuries ago, and we are now at the end of two centuries of dramatic economic growth. Economic growth uh, in human history was essentially unknown, uh, except in the most gradual and almost imperceptible way for the first 10,000 years of civilization. And in the uh, best reconstruction of the macro economy of the world, it's only in the last two centuries that we've had a uh, rate of economic change that within a generational span is strongly observable. Uh, so that it's really only in the last two centuries that within one's life, one would see a dramatic change of society and technology in real time in a lifetime. Uh, in a famous essay that John Maynard Keynes wrote, a beautiful essay uh, that he wrote in 1930 in the uh, depth of the Great Depression called the economic possibilities for our grandchildren when he projected a world in which poverty would be eliminated in Britain and in uh, other high income countries and indeed uh, uh, foresaw that correctly. He noted that if a peasant were to have come from the Roman Empire to England in 1800 he would not feel out of place uh, because the technologies and the basic organization and the rural life and the pace of life would have been relatively unchanged from Roman times until 18th century England. And then everything changed. And this curve is a reconstruction by a late uh, macro historian, Angus Madison, uh, of uh, who uh, attempted to reconstruct a set of uh, what we call national income accounts from 1 AD until now. I've started it at 1500, but essentially if you look at per capita income, the best reconstruction is nothing happens for uh, 300 years. And then the curve starts to turn up and uh, we have, in the end, uh, roughly uh, uh, a, uh, by this reconstruction, a 15-time increase of per capita income. It's not so meaningful to compare such a number over a span of 200 years with all the technological change, but the main point is this long stretch in which there's no perceptible change, and then the takeoff to global economic growth. And this takeoff, I think most historians now agree, started with one basic invention, and that's the steam engine. And it was the ability to mobilize mass energy for the first time beyond animal traction and a little bit of wind power in sails and windmills and a little bit of water power in uh, riverways that transformed the economy fundamentally. Until then, as historians now call it, we were trapped in the organic economy. Uh, it was what animal traction and human uh, effort could make, and that meant for a rural, limited economy that could not really break out of 90% uh, rural life, and it was only with the steam engine that uh, all of this changed. What's interesting about economic development is that we then, because of institutional change and because of some fundamental nature, I would say, of uh, scientific knowledge and technological knowledge, 
have had a cumulative process. And the cumulative process has given waves of major technological breakthroughs. Uh, the steam engine led to the first uh, set of breakthroughs, the uh, Faraday's uh, laws and uh, electrification, uh, and the internal combustion engine led to a second wave of breakthroughs. Uh, uh, arguably, uh, the uh, uh, age of uh, mass communication uh, and uh, radio uh, and eventually television, uh, a third wave. Some people speak of uh, the age of computation, starting with Turing and Neumann uh, and integrated circuits, and now uh, artificial intelligence as being the fourth great wave. But what is impressive about the last 200 years is despite all of the turmoil, the chaos, uh, the, the uh, uh, political upheavals which inevitably accompanied the transformation from rural life to urban life and from local to global, the cumulative driver of economic change has remained scientific, technical waves of breakthrough. And our era is no different, uh, probably as fundamental a transformation underway right now as the steam era or as the internal combustion era through computation and artificial intelligence and everything that Moore's Law is bringing. And the implication of this, uh, one thing that accompanied this was the capacity to support population through the agricultural revolution, essentially, and all of the scientific basis of agriculture, von Liebig and, uh, and uh, 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 the uh, uh, production of uh, artificial uh, ammonia fertilizers, uh, which gave rise to a 10-time rise of global population. And the scale of human activity, the first slide was per capita GDP. The second slide was population. This is total output, uh, as Angus Madison reconstructed it for the world. And it is a... Uh, 200-fold uh, or 250-time increase from 1,500 to his estimate for 2006. Again, not to be taken too precisely. But you can see we're in a different kind of world, uh, of course, from uh, anything that would have been recognized up until 1800, really even for most of the world until 1900. The one thing that didn't change at all, of course, in the midst of uh, this economic revolution was the scale of Earth systems themselves. So we have had uh, roughly a 10-time increase of world population by some arbitrariness, a 10 to 20-time increase of income per capita, roughly a 200-time increase of total economic output if such a number is meaningful over the last 200 years, and the Earth itself has remained finite uh, and has uh, not expanded uh, at all. Uh, uh, and the result is that after 200 years of rapid economic growth, we have begun to press extraordinarily uh, harshly against ecological limits. And that is, for me, the defining feature of our time, that if you have this kind of uh, cumulative uh, global growth uh, over two centuries, uh, especially in uh, some of the unconstrained ways that it's taking place, which I'll talk about, uh, it's not perhaps surprising that we are devouring now our life support systems through this uh, um, very dynamic process, which is certainly in no way uh, uh, ebbing uh, for the moment. Now, of course, the economic change was hugely uneven, and that gave rise to the processes of geopolitics, which basically are processes of uneven economic development. 
And uh, the most uh, important dynamic, of course, was that industrialization, based on the steam engine first and then the mobilization of uh, oil, gas through the internal combustion engine, uh, the gas turbine, and so forth, started in one very well-defined place, and that was England. And then it diffused gradually from England to uh, the lands of English settlement, the United States, uh, Canada, Australia, and to Western Europe. And the diffusion of this technological revolution was uh, remarkably gradual and led to a shocking uh, and rapid transformation of uh, global society. So this uh, blue line is measuring the share of total world output, again, using Madison's uh, data for Asia and for Europe. Uh, and uh, the red is for North America, and uh, the rest is uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, here. And of course, the drama of the 19th century was that uh, Europe, according to, again, this reconstruction, had a gradual rise of uh, share of world production from the age of discovery onward, uh, when uh, the voyages of Columbus and da Gama uh, took place, a gradual rise, uh, and then uh, uh, James Watt, about here, patented his steam engine, uh, Napoleon uh, launched his wars, and after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the surge of industrialization took place, uh, and the relative uh, rise of Europe in the world output and the relative fall of Asia in total output was a change of the global scene, really, that had uh, uh, not uh, had no precedent over the preceding 2,000 years. Basically, for 2,000 years, China and India, as the most populous parts of the world, were also the centers of a relatively stable, but still uh, more advanced technology center. And Europe was pretty much a backwater, uh, or if not a backwater, just a modest part of the world. Uh, and it was really only in the 19th century that the uh, rise of the West, so-called, became quantitatively decisive. And uh, of course, starting with the rise of uh, England uh, and then overtaken by Germany, uh, meaning that uh, by uh, the eve of World War I, Europe reached its uh, apogee at about half of the world output, about 20% of the world population. And Asia, which because of India and China had long been 60% uh, of uh, the world economy, fell to being about a quarter of the world economy. Uh, one other country uh, joined the scene uh, after uh, our uh, civil war, basically uh, industrialization in the United States uh, took off, and by uh, uh, roughly uh, 19, uh, actually around uh, 1870, the U.S. became the single largest economy. Uh, by um, but still uh, smaller than uh, Western Europe, you can see. Uh, but this is the surge of, uh, of the U.S. economy. And the rest of the world remained no-shows uh, in terms of industrialization. Uh, Latin America, a supplier of primary resources. Africa, uh, basically remaining non-industrialized until today. But now the world's changing, and uh, we're in the midst of a quite decisive change of geopolitics as well. The whole world economy continues to grow, but now Asia is resurging. 
And the basic uh, dynamic is very straightforward, which is that with uh, the gain of uh, sovereignty and independence of both India and China after World War II, uh, and with the uh, end of uh, European imperialism, it became possible for those two giants to begin the process of industrialization. And indeed, uh, both India and China, of course, China more than India, have been able to uh, absorb technology, achieve growth rates that are catching up growth rates for China, roughly 10% per year since 1978 uh, to about 2012. 10% per year annual growth means, of course, a doubling of the size of the economy every seven years. You do that for 35 years, uh, you have a 32-time uh, increase of output. And the result is uh, that uh, we have reached just now the point where the so-called Western world, Europe, the United States, Canada, and Oceania, uh, has been overtaken by East Asia. Uh, so we're just at the transformative moment of geopolitics when, and you feel it, don't you? Uh, you feel that this is a, a crossroads uh, in history. The United States is uh, accelerating the process uh, by uh, uh, waving a big flag saying we're nuts. Uh, we're absolutely incoherent, do not follow us, uh, I make no sense, and I'll tweet you in the morning. Uh, but uh, that process is not completely uh, electing a crazy president, and I'm speaking in technical terms, at the place of a former asylum. Uh, electing a crazy president is partly a deep American neurosis of the loss of primacy. So we're also going through a neurotic uh, decompensation because the United States is clearly not alone at the top, which it got used to for the last 50 years. And it cannot be at the top anymore because of the basic nature of technological diffusion and now technological innovation in Europe. And this is part of the neurosis. This is the IMF's estimates of the shares of the US and China in the world. And according to the IMF data, which is, not the, is a little bit contested by some others, China is now the world's largest economy. So uh, China overtook the US around 2012 in the IMF data. And clearly, the US is growing maybe at 2.5% per year. China is growing at about 6.5% per year. So <laughs> the gap continues to widen. In per capita terms, the US is still roughly three times larger than China uh, because China has a four times larger population. But this is a fundamental geopolitical uh, change. One more point for us to keep in mind as I turn to sustainable development is the dynamics of the world population. <coughs> the, these are projections for the future. We've had a nine-fold increase of population since Thomas Malthus wrote The Principles of Population in 1798, saying we're going to have a population problem. Remember, Malthus uh, argued that if you were able to grow more food, population will catch up behind it. Uh, he didn't get everything right in the modeling. He thought inevitably that population would uh, grow to drive per capita income back down to subsistence any time there was a gain in productivity so that we would be uh, condemned to a baseline subsistence level in the long term because, as he said, population would grow geometrically and the economy would grow only arithmetically. He, did, he got some things right in that the rise of output per capita did tremendously accelerate global population. When he wrote, there were about 900 million people. 
and now $7.6 billion on the way to $9 billion at, at minimum, if we don't do something disastrous. Uh, but he misunderstood two points. One is that there has been geometric growth of output, not only arithmetic growth of output. And second, he did not anticipate that at higher incomes and more education, there would be a demographic transition. And so he neither anticipated modern contraception nor the economics of a demographic transition that would eventually lead to the end of geometric population growth for high income populations. But we're not past Malthusian dynamics yet. It's, we're not out of the woods because first, we're not yet proven that we can even live sustainably at the income levels that we have. So the dynamics of seven or eight or nine billion people could still drive down our per capita income in the future. And second, we have one region in the world that is still without a demographic transition, and that's Sub-Saharan Africa. Because in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is not industrialized, which still has a lot of poverty, which still has a very significant proportion of young girls not able to get a basic education, and therefore without a demographic transition, the fertility rate remains five in Africa. That means every uh, woman is on statistical average for sub-Saharan Africa having five children or two and a half daughters replacing each mother. And that means a tendency for the population to be doubling. And basically, the UN projection for Africa in what's called the medium fertility forecast is for two more doublings of the African population. And that's what's shown here. A little bit amazingly, uh, Africa right now has about 1.4 billion people in total. Actually, I don't remember whether that's sub-Saharan or total Africa that I put on my graph, so I apologize. But there are about 1 billion people in sub-Saharan Africa, another 300 uh, million in North Africa, roughly 1.3 billion. And in the medium fertility projection of the UN, that will reach 4.4 billion people by 2100. And for sub-Saharan Africa, it will go from 1 billion to 3.9 billion. So two doublings left in this century. That is not, uh, that's, that's not an unconditional, or it is, let me say, it is an unconditional probabilistic forecast. It's not an inevitability. If we had the wit to help ensure that girls would go to school, uh, which is the single most basic investment that should be made through development assistance, but Europe hasn't figured that out yet. But if it did, Africa's population would probably peak at two and a half billion, not four. So it would be possible to turn that demographic curve sharply lower. But I point this out just to emphasize that uh, under the current projections, Africa will reach 40% of the world's population. 4.4 billion out of uh, 11 billion in 2100. My strong argument to African leaders is that's not good for you. Better to get the kids to school, better to try to uh, have a peak population closer to two to two and a half billion it's almost impossible for it to peak at lower than that just because of the young population right now, uh, which is so vastly more numerous than their parents that there is at least a billion that is pure population momentum, meaning if the fertility rate immediately went to replacement, there would still be a billion more Africans coming just by virtue of the, uh, the age population pyramid right now, this vast young population on the continent. OK, all of this means that we have, to summarize, a rapidly growing world population. The uh, I'm sorry, rapidly growing world economy. 
still growing at between 3 and 4 percent per year. That means a doubling time roughly of 20 years. We have a still growing world population where the growth rate now has come down to about 1.1 percent. That's 80 million net increase of population per year. That growth rate will decline, but the 80 million will continue linearly for probably the next 15 to 20 years. We're on a trajectory to reach 8 billion people by perhaps 2021 or 2022, 9 billion people by roughly 2040, and on a path if this basic trajectory were to continue to reach about 11 billion people by the end of the century. And we're in a period of massive uh, geopolitical tectonic shift because the Western dominance is ending and the center of gravity of the world is shifting to Asia. And many of the most important dynamics of the world, climate change, uh, future of technological uh, change, global politics will be increasingly centered in Asia rather than in the North Atlantic as it has been for the last two centuries. So this is also a major change. One of the key drivers of this continued change is of course that Asia has become, East Asia has become a technological innovator. And this is fundamental and it's new, relatively new. Of course, Ch uh, Japan already began the process of what we call endogenous growth, technological cutting edge uh, innovation in the 1960s. Not really so much beforehand. Beforehand, Japan was a rapid catching up country. It became an innovating country. What is notable now is that China is in the midst of becoming a science and technology powerhouse, of course. And uh, this slide, which is way out of date because I can't find an updated picture of this, uh, is showing uh, where patenting is taking place. And basically, we now have uh, three broad areas of so-called endogenous growth. Uh, that is technology leading to further technology of the United States, principally uh, in the East and West Coast, uh, of course, Western Europe, and Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, and China. And if you consider Northeast Asia as a block, which I believe will be the truth 20 years from now, so that China, Japan, and Korea will not be divided along a U.S.-China competition, but will be an integrated uh, economic and political space, that will be by far the largest uh, source of innovation, patenting, and R&D in the world. Uh, it already has overtaken Europe and the United States in total patenting, of course not in quality yet, uh, as best one can measure this, but I think that that's a very short, uh, very short change ahead. So what are the implications of this? One is there's a lot of instability in global governance because we are past the age of U.S. or Western leadership, and the world generally is not great at these transitions. <laughs> Uh, and so this is a time of uh, a lot of instability. There's a theory from one of my teachers uh, about uh, the Great Depression uh, being uh, the, uh, caused in part by the fact that the U.S. had become the economic leader by the 1920s but without the economic, without the geopolitical responsibility, whereas the UK had already retreated from its geopolitical leadership, and so when crisis came, there was no leader. Uh, and this is the so-called Kindleberger hypothesis or 
the hegemonic transition theory. We're not changing from US hegemonic rule to China hegemonic rule. We're changing from US leadership to nobody leading right now. So we're in a period where there is no discernible leader in uh, global affairs. Uh, and that is just a period of uh, perhaps better than having a leader that's not a very responsible leader. My wife is always uh, very unhappy when we talk about US leadership. Uh, uh, but uh, with no leader, it's quite complicated. And we're in a mess right now of uh, no clear responsibility for the global system. The US, of course, is in a self-inflicted rant of America first, whatever that means. Uh, China is a responsible actor, we hope and think, though this past week was a little bit disconcerting. Uh, I have to say, uh, Europe is not exactly in a position of coherence and leadership uh, right now. Uh, it is uh, an impressive amalgamation of 28 countries or 27 or something, uh, but um, it is uh, not exactly with the foreign policy. And so this is really a complicated time. There's another theory uh, which uh, I, I think is bunkum, except that it has a, uh, it, it a self-fulfilling element to it, and that is that rising powers threaten leading powers and uh, are conducive to conflict. And this is, of course, one telling of the rise of Germany uh, and the competition with Britain. Uh, in some historiography uh, explains uh, World War I and World War II. Uh, it is uh, a vision that is in some historiography an explanation of Japan and the West uh, in a uh, period from 1895 to 1945 of two, uh, well, several Japanese wars, uh, first uh, against Russia, 1905, first against actually Taiwan and Korea, then Russia, 1905, uh, and uh, then China from the 1930s, uh, and uh, World War uh, II in the Pacific from 1939 and 1941. And the claim is that the US and China are headed for such a collision as well. Of course, in this case, uh, as one of our comic songwriters said, if you want to write about the US-China war, you better do it now. There will be no chance afterwards. Uh, so uh, th this is uh, not like uh, earlier conflicts. Uh, this is the one that has to be avoided at all costs. I have to say that while I regard the idea of the US and China as being on a collision course as uh, kind of fanciful gaming of uh, military strategists uh, that is naive and, and deeply unhelpful. There is an element of reality to it in that this is really how they think. So there is a new uh, US security doctrine that was issued this year, which identifies uh, the US, uh, in which the US identifies China as a strategic competitor. Uh, and it says in the doctrine that China is out to uh, end the global order uh, or to subvert the global order. It's a little insane, by the way as if China doesn't have the right to develop, to become uh, a scientifically uh, powerful country, uh, to become a technology powerhouse. Uh, and the US looks to China's no doubt growing military as signs of this without recognizing that the US outspends China three to one and in terms of foreign military bases, it's 700 to one. 
China has one overseas military base, a small naval base in Djibouti. The United States has 700 military bases. But the U.S. psyche in the military establishment is clearly in fervent overdrive right now. And that is very dangerous because these people are not normal. Uh, and so we have, to, we, we have to be careful. We really have to be careful uh, because this can become a self-fulfilling drive. And when Trump puts on the tariffs this past week, this is only about China. The main driver of this is a lousy economist in the White House. Uh, well, it's Trump's fantasy plus an economist that has a Harvard PhD from when I was there, and I do not remember him, and I do not understand how it could have happened. Uh, but uh, there is somebody named Peter Navarro who writes books that say every time we buy from China, we are weakening American leadership in the world. So we have to stop, and we have to economically contain China. It's quite a crazy idea, but it's what is behind last week's announcement, which was generally deemed to be a crazy idea by almost everybody. But it's there. So this is a second theory of uh, global reality for our time. There is a third theory, which is uh, Kissinger's, which is uh, sane, I would say, but modeled uh, very much on uh, uh, Metternich, uh, and that is uh, the 19th century balance of power, which indeed kept Europe modestly peaceful for much of the time. Uh, there were a few odds and ends in the, 19, in the 1860s and 1870s uh, as uh, Germany and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 Italy uh, took formation. There was the Crimean War. Uh, there were the wars in the Balkans uh, afterwards and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Bulgarian War and so forth. It wasn't very peaceful. Europe got its uh, military drive uh, fulfilled by taking over the rest of the world, not so much by fighting each other, but this was called, anyway, balance of uh, power, and that's Kissinger's uh, view. And I want to introduce my own at this point, which is that we should actually cooperate with each other. Uh, and so it's a naive uh, view that maybe war is actually not the best impulse uh, or balance of power is not the right view. We have a fundamental set of common interests right now that we had better address with alacrity. Uh, and uh, that is uh, this fact that after a two order of magnitude growth in the world economy, we are now in a common shared ecological crisis. And it is such an advanced stage of crisis that we may not be able to avoid any more profound irreversibilities. There are, by the language of the ecologist, planetary boundaries that we are uh, violating at this point because of this sustained growth of global output. And in two important papers in 2009 and 2015, a group of leading ecologists defined a uh, number of so-called planetary boundaries, including uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, including uh, CO2, uh, dissolved CO2 in uh, the oceans, uh, leading to ocean acidification, uh, changes of vegetative cover, especially deforestation, as we push our food systems and so forth. I think it's right to define these planetary boundaries in three basic ways. One is greenhouse gas emissions leading to global warming and ocean acidification, number one. Second is land transformation, mainly for human food production, that at this point appropriates about 
50% of net primary production uh, from photosynthesis. So we've taken over half of the photosynthesis for our uh, farms and our rangelands. And that's a lot in view from the perspective of the other 10 million species who say, what happened to our food supply? So we're pushing the rest of the species uh, into extinction uh, pretty relentlessly. And the third is mass scale industrial pollution, which is killing maybe 10 million people through air pollution alone per year in Asia and having devastating long-term effects on soils, uh, on uh, urban environments, water supplies, uh, river sheds, and so forth. So the scale of human activity is creating three colossal uh, environmental crises. Two of them are on human scale probably irreversible. Climate change, because the residence time of CO2 is in century scale, so whatever we put up in CO2 is going to be warming the planet for centuries ahead. And species extinction, which is also, despite science fiction and Michael Crichton, an irreversible process. And we're in the process of destroying biodiversity at a mass scale. The quantification of this is grim. It's grim because we can't get our heads around this, and we can't get our policies around this, and we can't nudge the world economy in a different direction. Because the world economy is driven by certain basic political economic principles. It's largely driven by market forces and greed. That's very powerful, uh, and we're trying to battle those forces with ideas, and so far we haven't uh, turned the corner on that. So it was already 40 years ago, 46 years ago, that the world first gathered at governmental level to discuss this impending collision between a geometric growth of world economy and the finite planet. And that was in Stockholm in the so-called uh, UN Conference on the Human Environment, the first such environmental global meeting. 20 years later was the Rio Earth Summit, where by then the concept of sustainable development had been propounded by the Brundtland Commission. And it was adopted in 1992 as the organizing principle for global cooperation. So sustainable development's not a new idea. Officially, it is 26 years now at the center of supposed global cooperation. But the notable fact of that Earth Summit in 1992 was that three agreements were reached to curb human-induced climate change in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, to curb the loss of biodiversity in the Convention on Biological Diversity, and to stop the spread of land degradation in the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. And land degradation is particularly a phenomenon of dryland regions. And the idea of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification was to stop the spread of desert and land degradation, especially in the dryland parts of the world. Well, 20 years after the Rio summit, the governments got together one more time to review progress, and there was none. What there was was continued growth of the world economy at about 3.5% per year, in other words, a doubling during that past 20 years, China had become the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases overtaking the United States. We had arrived at an annual release of CO2 into the atmosphere of about 35 billion tons per year. The carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was rising during that period by two parts per million. So it had increased from uh, 
maybe 360 parts per million around the time of Rio to four, near 400 parts per million in 2012. And biological diversity was continuing to face disaster with absolutely no break anywhere for species protection. If anything, the rise of China was putting such a demand on feed grain production and on food loads and on imported hardwoods that the spread of deforestation was tremendously accelerated in the Indonesian archipelago and in the Amazon basin. And so 20 years on, nothing had changed except more intensification of this instability. And no leadership uh, because of uh, the uh, increasing, actually already, neuroticism of the United States and China. How can we slow down when the other might catch up? And the United States, interestingly, just as a footnote, in 1992 when we signed the first UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, it said the rich countries should lead. The United States, of course, never signed the Kyoto Protocol to implement that. Why? The Senate in the US was very clear. It said, we won't do anything if the developing countries aren't also doing the same thing. That meant China. Why did the Senate say that? Because of this neurotic fixation on a rising power. What did China say at the time? China said, read what you signed and ratified. It said, you move first, thank you. And so China said, we don't have to do anything. The US said, we won't do anything unless you do it. And that led to 20 years of complete inaction by the two largest emitting countries in the world. The reason we have a Paris Climate Agreement in 2015 is that President Obama and President Xi Jinping walked through the door together. That was the change from 1997 to 2015 was that by then China was now the largest emitting country. It had already caught up with the US. It was choking on its own air because it's so polluted. And it no longer felt in the mood to say we won't do anything. And the United States said, we'll do it if you do it. And China said, we'll do it if you do it. And they both walked through the door. And then came Donald Trump. And I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> um, our situation is, therefore, very late in the stage of environmental sustainability and very complicated politically right now. And the time for remediation is extraordinarily short. I'll just focus for one moment on the Paris Climate Agreement. The climatologists have told us, do not go over 2 degrees C without risk of multiple highly dangerous feedbacks that could lead to the system running out of control through positive feedback dynamics and the fact that even at 2 degrees C, the amount of danger to basic food supplies, to disease transmission, and to sea level rise are profound. We're at 1.1 degrees C now. The best evidence is that to stay below 2 degrees C, much less the Paris Climate Agreement objective of staying well below 2 degrees C, whatever that means, say 1.7 or 1.8 degrees C relative to pre-industrial temperature, much less below the ambition mentioned in the Paris Agreement of trying to stay below 1.5 degrees C, is that we're essentially out of time. And the best simple representation of that from the ensemble of climate modeling 
is the so-called carbon budget of remaining emissions that would still give us at least, say, a two-thirds probability of achieving that upper limit of warming. Best estimate now from today onward of the carbon budget for a two-thirds probability of staying below two degrees C is 600 billion tons remaining. 600 billion tons is 15 years at today's annual emissions of 40 billion tons per year. 15 years left for a two-thirds probability of remaining below 2 degrees C. My climate colleague, James Hansen, who is one of our world's great climatologists, tells me that 2 degrees C is reckless and profoundly dangerous because it almost guarantees the loss of the ice sheets. Not necessarily on a decadal schedule, maybe on a 100-year or 200-year time stamp, but the last time Earth was 2 degrees C warmer than pre-industrial, which was the previous interglacial, the sea level was 8 meters higher than now. And so from Hansen's point of view, this whole idea of 2 degrees C is extraordinarily naive and reckless because we should insist on no more than one degree, which means we should be scooping up CO2 from the atmosphere, not anticipating another 600 billion cumulative emission. But we're nowhere close to stopping in 15 years. And the tendency is a continued rise. We have not peaked in CO2 emissions. And if you want to see how weird the world is, when I stop, but please not before I stop, get out your phones and look up CERA, C-E-R-A, which is the largest meeting of the uh, oil and gas industry each year, taking place in Houston right now. And every speech is about how we need to, I just saw the Saudi Aramco uh, CEO saying we need, I don't remember, maybe he said $20 trillion of investment in oil and gas to replace what we have to anticipate the growing world demand. They're out of their minds and they're out of control. And that's the state of the world. So we're at the end of this story where we need a decisive transformation and these are scenarios that have been given by the climatology. Uh, these are emissions curves of gigatons per year emission. We have to decarbonize under almost any scenario by mid-century to have a, even a likely, that means two-thirds in the jargon, chance of achieving the Paris limit. By mid-century. And yet the oil and gas industry is in Houston today not saying a word about climate, talking about the trillions of investment, and owning the State Department, the White House, and the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Republican Party in the US Congress. And by ownership, I mean ownership. There is a deed. They own these people. They bought them fair and square. They pay the bribes and they vote for them fair and square. So American politics is completely corrupt and it's owned by the oil industry. And that's why we have these ridiculous announcements that we have. That's the drama that we're in. And just a point, the world food supply is very complicated. It is a global scale enterprise. China is the main driver because China is, as you know, 7% of the world's land area and 20% of the world's population. And uh, that means it is a net importer of food and it is the main driver of global trade in food. And therefore, it's the main driver of deforestation as well. 
because the process of land use loss is basically driven by feed grains, by soybean production margin, by cattle ranch margin for food production, and by forestry margin. And that's driven now by China's dynamic. And so that's why we're losing uh, the archipelagos, uh, in, uh, the, the uh, archipelagic uh, rainforest uh, in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia and the Amazon, and a massive destruction of wilderness. Okay, so what do we do with time limited, both for my lecture and for humanity? Uh, we have to hurry, uh, and I'll hurry. Uh, there's a glimmer of good news. Now, there's one foothold remaining, I believe. And that is that uh, most governments, or I would say almost all governments, I would have said all governments until January 20th, uh, 2017, know the truth, whether they care about the truth or not is a secondary matter. But governments know the truth. And so in a brief moment of lucidity of the international system, at the end of 2015, the governments tried to reinvigorate their desire to change the direction of the world economy. What does that mean? It means to make basic transformations to live within the planetary boundaries. And to do so, they adopted two basic core agreements. One was September 25th, 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals, or what's called Agenda 2030. This is an intergovernmental agreement that reasserts the centrality of sustainable development as the organizing principle for global cooperation. It did not work the first time, so they're saying it again. And there's no guarantee it's going to work the second time. And then a few weeks later, on December 12, 2015, the world agreed on the Paris Climate Agreement. In both cases, unanimously, by all 193 UN member states. This, I believe, is our last chance, actually given the irreversibilities of biodiversity loss and climate change, to have a chance to get these under control. So I haven't even defined sustainable development, and I'll just define it succinctly by saying it means, in the UN jargon, economic development that is socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. And 17 goals express that idea of combining economic development. It's not a no-growth agenda. It's a claim that the world economy can grow within planetary boundaries and within the boundaries of social fairness. That's a claim. I would say, as a professor of sustainable development and someone who has spent the last 20 years trying to think about this, my succinct conclusion is this is feasible. This is not wrong intrinsically as some think that we have to stop growth because there's no way to grow economically within the boundaries of fairness and uh, <coughs> ecological sustainability. I believe that there is the capacity to do that, but that it is politically and technically very difficult. But I believe it is our best shot. So what does it really mean? It means a series of specific challenges. First, and probably most central and easy to grasp, is we need to decarbonize the energy system. This is a well-defined proposition. It means in 2050, all coal, oil, and gas has been substituted by wind, solar, nuclear, geothermal, hydro, 
or other low carbon energy sources. And if you don't like nuclear, buy that other uh, set of opportunities. It means basically no more internal combustion engines, but a move to electric vehicles. It means, as I like to tell them, that ExxonMobil becomes a footnote in history, that you're going out of business. That's what I keep telling them. They don't believe me, but I'm telling them in 2050, you're gone. You have to be gone because there's no place in the world for you. There's one footnote to that, and that is that there could be some carbon capture and storage as a small part of the action, but I have never seen a scenario where we're going to capture and store 40 billion tons of CO2 per year as a useful activity on the planet as opposed to using solar and wind, hydro and geothermal, which give us more than enough energy to run a complex global scale society if we can master the technologies of intermittency, storage, systems balance, and so on. So that's number one. Number two is changing our land use for environmental sustainability. There is one fundamental transformation that could play a huge role, and that is if we dramatically reduced our beef consumption worldwide. Because feed grain production is a fundamental driver of land use change and deforestation, as is expan ex the expansion of rangelands for, uh, for uh, ranching. And so a change of diet may be the single most important way to draw lines on the map but we need clear lines on the map. It's not only soybeans and feed grain for beef, though that is a hundreds of millions of tons of uh, grain production per year. It's also products like uh, palm oil, which could be, at a profit basis, would lead to the complete deforestation of Malaysia and Indonesia and still be profitable because there's no limit to the world's capacity to profitably absorb that. Of course, we would have no more orangutans. Uh, we would have uh, no more biodiversity of the Indonesian archipelago, the Wallace Zone. We would have devastation. Those countries would not be viable uh, also. But we need a change to sustainable agriculture and nutrition. Both these changes to decarbonization and to sustainable agriculture have huge co-benefits of health because in both cases the fossil fuels are killing us by air pollution if they're not killing us by sea level rise, storms and droughts. And the excess meat consumption is killing us by metabolic disease. Uh, if it's not killing us by destruction of habitat and loss of biodiversity. So there are clear co-benefits of uh, behaviorally uh, and for, for human health if we choose to go that way. The third basic transformation is universal access to education, health, and skills. And there if I could say one thing for European policy, and I've said it for 10 years without any effect at all, zero, it is that Europe should devote its entire aid budget to helping African children get a decent education, period. Because that is essential for development and it is essential for the demographic transition. And if Europe cares about migration, there is nothing better than an educated, prosperous Africa uh, that isn't sending, uh, forcing through migration of poverty uh, millions or tens or hundreds of millions of people in desperate search of alternatives. 
A fourth area that is part of this transformation is redistribution of income from capital to labor. The reason is, in a nutshell, that our economies are becoming more and more capital intensive, meaning that the share of incomes going to capital is rising relentlessly. If you measure capital to include human capital, high-skilled work, intellectual property, as well as physical capital, and that trend is going to be accelerated by artificial intelligence and smart systems because the robots really are better. At least they're better than me. I, you're probably better than them still. But uh, 10 years from now, you'll get a lecture by the robot economist, not by me. Uh, and it'll be more knowledgeable and uh, better, resor better research because I can't keep up with the journals. There are thousands of them. But uh, artificial intelligence will be able to do that. But quite seriously, the income distribution is shifting away from unskilled work. That's why we have a backlash in our societies, because people with a high school degree do not have a stable foothold in our societies. They are the ones that elected Donald Trump. Of course, he has no idea at all and cares less about them, but they're his electorate. And so we need redistribution of income. Of course, what have we just done? We have just cut taxes on capital income, the opposite of what's needed. Because capital is not only gaining in market terms, it is politically ascendant. It runs the United States government, after all. That's where all the campaign contributions come from. And so we're in a feedback loop right now of really bizarre proportions when we need instead to be fighting for social inclusion. Fifth, we need directed technological change for sustainable agriculture, for energy transformation, for universal access to basic health care using genomics uh, and other uh, advances that are being studied here for the next flu epidemic, the next recombinant uh, uh, emerging disease, and they're coming every year now. Uh, we're spreading uh, new disease vectors, uh, range of disease. We talked about dengue fever at the meeting that I'm at at IASA today, which is spreading dramatically in range because of climate change. And so we need a lot of directed technological change. And by that I mean driven by problem solving and the problem solving of sustainable development. Food security, resiliency, low carbon energy, and social inclusion. And directing technological change for those purposes, using artificial intelligence to bring quality health and education to low income populations, for example and those kinds of directed changes. And finally, we need transnational cooperation because every one of these problems exists at a regional and a global scale. Europe cannot decarbonize with 28 separate energy policies. Europe needs an energy policy as Europe. So far, it doesn't have it. It has European-wide targets, but national energy policies. Even Europe, which is the region most advanced in the whole world in intergovernmental cooperation, cannot overcome German lignite and Polish coal. And so it's stymied. Even at this date, we can't get a European grid based on renewable energy. We can't even get a German grid based on renewable energy because the launder do not want high voltage lines over their head from the North Sea to Bavaria. And so we're stuck in cooperation at all scales. And that is a huge problem. So let me end here with this paradox of problem solving. My analysis to you in a succinct way, it's uh, just stated, 
is that from a technological and economic point of view, a transformation to sustainability is possible, even with the 30 years left. In other words, it is perfectly feasible at relatively low cost to be out of the fossil fuel business in 2050. We could stop selling internal combustion engine vehicles by 2025, in fact, certainly by 2030. With a 20-year fleet turnover by 2050, all vehicles could be electric. We could phase out all fossil fuels because we have solar alone, we have at a scale of roughly 5,000 times our current power use for global society of incoming radiation. And even high quality sources, if carried on high voltage, long distance, direct current lines, could reach population centers for solar power alone, not to mention wind, hydro, nuclear, and others. So we could do this. But, and we could do it probably, I'll give you a number, probably at about 5% of our global output per year, incrementally invested towards these objectives of social inclusion and environmental sustainability. In other words, a modest but not insignificant change of behavior globally. But we're not doing it. And we're, it is so hard even to turn the, even to shift the trajectory with all of the meetings, all of the agreements, all of the treaties, and so on. And of course, with Trump, it's gotten a lot worse because the US is completely incoherent and from a policy point of view, wholly taken over by the oil industry in the last year, which is cognitively and emotionally and politically out of control. So what do, we, what do we have? What do we need? We need long-term planning. We're not good at that. Planning in the US parlance is communism. We must not plan. Even now, a day ahead. We live day by day. What will be the tweet of the day? If you plan ahead, you're a planner. If you're a planner, you're un-American. I kid you not. We have no planning mechanisms in the United States government at all, except the Pentagon. We literally have no planning agencies. None. No economy ministry, no planning department, and so forth. So that is problem number one. Our politics are relentlessly short-term. Our needs are to project 20 or 30 years ahead and follow a logical line. We need new technologies, but we have entrenched interests. That's not new, it's just dire right now. The oil and gas industry needs to go out of business. It's quite straightforward arithmetically. It's quite feasible. Those of us who are not CEOs of oil companies wouldn't even notice it, by the way. Because just the profits going to the small group that owns these companies is enough to pay for the transformation to renewable energy. There's no cost to us net of making that transformation. The cost is that those who own the shares of the oil industry will lose. I'm not too interested in compensating them for that loss. It would be hard to do. They're not too interested in that grand bargain either. So I'd like to sue them to go out of business, basically, as social hazards and public nuisances, which I believe them to be, and a conspiracy against humanity at this point. Third is we need fiscal redistribution, because the systemic changes underway are leaving a lot of people behind. 
Instead, we have, in the US, neoliberalism, meaning that people have read Ayn Rand. I don't know if you have. But in America, she is considered not a lousy novelist, but a high philosopher. This is terrifying, if you've ever read one of her books. They are uh, pay-ins to greed, and greed is the dominant American impulse. Or, as the President of the United States says, there are killers and losers, told to him by his daddy. And therefore, we have the son as he is. Uh, so we need a lot of fiscal redistribution. Europe is the only place in the world that does this. The social market philosophy is the correct guiding philosophy. It just doesn't win votes anymore. But it is absolutely the right principle. It's the only one that has proven itself able to lean against market forces to keep inequality relatively under control. We need globalization because the systems changes absolutely cannot be done at a national scale. They can't even be done at a continental scale. It is probably the case that for renewable energy, we need a global grid, which China is promoting. China's promoting what they call global energy interconnection to connect all of the high density renewable energy sources, the high quality wind and solar fields to be connected on long distance, high voltage direct current lines, which have very small loss even at scales of thousands of kilometers. And that's a very smart idea. But we need trust in order to do that. Instead, we have energy nationalism, food nationalism, a breakdown of trade, and a breakdown of trust globally. We need expertise. And at least in the United States, expertise is deliberately under assault. We've not seen anything like this in our modern history in the US. But if you poll the Republican public, Republican Party public, they now say in the most recent poll, 58% declared that universities are against the interests of society. This is a change of about 25 percentage points from two years ago. And this is a rising hate. This region has known it well. We're experiencing that right now. And this is a moment when we need expertise more than ever. But there is a deliberate campaign to break expertise because it runs against vested interests. And so it's not an accident. It's not general benightedness. It is a political campaign. And it's unfortunately at work. And we need a kind of governance in which government and business can work together without either one dominating the relationship. In other words, public and private true partnership rather than political capture by powerful business or government crushing business. That's a very delicate, difficult equilibrium to manage. You cannot transform the energy system without the cooperation of businesses. On the other hand, right now we have political capture by the oil and gas industry. And so this is the difficulty. So I'll conclude. Actually, I will say one more, one more thing. Universities. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're one of the last institutions standing that can have an important role in this. It's also not simple. But universities are just about the last major institutions in society that can look objectively at the issues, have the technical knowledge <coughs> to address them, have the time horizon to understand them, and have the capacity to put forward solutions. 
and that's by nature of our institutions. These are remarkable institutions. Universities are the second longest lived institutions in society. Uh, the church, the first, uh, and uh, the, the high church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, also has a pontifical academy of sciences that every day is campaigning for this transformation, by the way, completely on a scientific basis, with Pope Francis leading the scientific effort. So there we also have some partnership, <coughs> which is extremely important, and fought relentlessly by American conservatives, by the way, who say, how dare the Pope talk about climate change? It's really quite uh, stunning. But we need the universities to play a distinctive role. And I list five areas where I think the universities have a role to play, which is more forward than usual. It is more engaged. It is social problem solving. To an extent, not invited though many governments are inviting the universities because they know they cannot do this on their own. So the first is what I call mapping the pathways to sustainable development, meaning what are the energy transformations or the land use transformations that fit the requirements. Second, of course, is advanced education in sustainable development. That is a discipline. It's a new discipline. Uh, maybe uh, too new and too late, but we teach a degree at Columbia University, for example, a PhD in sustainable development. It's basically defined, by the way, as having one advisor in the policy sciences and one advisor in the physical sciences, and having to satisfy both of them. That's, I would say, my one sentence definition of what it is. It means being able to be comfortable in earth sciences, engineering sciences, and policy sciences so that one can take an integrated perspective of sophistication on these issues. Third is more sophisticated earth systems and social system monitoring, using the data of remote sensing, of satellites, of big data to understand better the state of the system its dynamics and its both perturbations and nonlinearities. Fourth is directed R&D, directed problem solving. We need good, low cost, high watt per kilogram batteries, for example, no doubt, at the level of vehicles and at the level of flow batteries for utility scale power. We need a variety of solutions like that. We need, uh, uh, today there was a, a new article about using graphene for uh, carbon reuse technologies by new catalysts that uh, allow for uh, reduction of CO2, uh, direct capture of CO2, reduction of CO2 to CO, and then transformation to synthetic hydrocarbons. So this is, uh, this is uh, um, green chemistry. We need directed solutions of this kind. And we need universities to help think through the new institutional design. Our governments do not work right now for these problems. And I believe we need to rethink governance in some basic ways. How can you make an energy policy in a democracy that has a time dimension of a quarter century. That is a governance challenge. That's not just good luck of, a, of electing the right government. That is structuring decision making in a manner that gives democratic oversight but long-term perspective. For example, we reinvented how our central banks work with some ups and downs, but on the whole, I would say successfully by giving them political independence. We need to find ways to invent the institutions for governance of sustainable development as well. Thank you for allowing me to talk so long. Appreciate it.